FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Financial Survival Network is brought to you today by Orin Resources, a junior exploration company with the appetite of a major. It's hot on the trail of the next globally significant discovery, creating enormous potential upside for you, the shareholder. Orin is one of the most aggressive exploration companies pursuing high-grade, scalable gold and copper deposits and has a premier seven-project portfolio, including its two flagships, Committee Bay in the Arctic and Sombrero in Peru. Orin's unparalleled technical team and highly experienced management has a history of success in advancing and monetizing exploration assets. No wonder Orin's been called one of the best in the junior exploration sector. Orin trades on the TSX and the NYSE under AUG. To learn more, go to orinresources.com. That's A-U-R-Y-N resources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. And if you've been listening to the show for any amount of time, you know that we talk with a number of mining company executives. We love the resource extraction sector because that is the source of all true wealth in the world. And when you hear different green um, advocates, they're always overlooking the fact that in order for a green agenda to ever actually happen, which is questionable, you've got to have the resources to do it. We've got a new sponsor, and with me now is the executive chairman of Orin Resources. His name is Ivan Bebek, and Ivan, you're kind of becoming a legend in this industry. We were talking before, and really your drive, your vision, your ambition, and your just desire for these major successes is rather unique in this day and age. Well, thank you very much. Yes, no, it's um, it's something that comes from, uh, I, I think, a path that started in my early teens where I watched a lot of my father and his successful friends and business ski trips and, and whatnot. I got to be privileged to a lot of successful businessmen and how they were conducting their business. And the dream started young and I've kind of take a page out of, I'm not sure who exactly, but extreme work ethic, you know, as a, a guide to being able to achieve any goal that I set forward to achieve. And, you know, I met some ex- extremely great people along the way, uh, my partner, Sean Wallace, as well as the technical team that we've got to work with. And once I set foot in the industry, you know, I remember this vividly where I told my dad, when I become a stockbroker and that's how I started, you know, heads are going to turn in the city. And, um, mm-hmm. my first year as a stockbroker, I made $300,000 in commission wow. and heads were certainly turning. I was 22 years old, turning 23 at the time. And, you know, that was a lot to digest as far as w- what was the future going to be like in 10 years from now. Well, it wasn't all roses. And the next year after mm-hmm. my second year, as a broker, I had a client that had margin accounts, which, which he couldn't pay. And I went negative a million dollars at 23 years old. So I got to see the other side of the sword, you know, not just the side of winning. And, um, you know, I took a, a four day break from everything in this business. And I said to myself, you know, it's not enough to come out here and make money. You know, I, I want to make a difference and I want to be, you know, a pillar of the industry if somehow. And, um, you know, there's no deposit big enough that I would be afraid to go and find. And uh, so I set out on a path. I worked with a gentleman named Dr. Roman Shkalenka. He's found seven major mines around the world. And he was not only a mentor that gave me two hours a day of his time for about three years straight as my teacher, but he also taught me a lot about the bigger deposits and, and how they're out there. Um, you know, as a, as a young person in terms of the mining side, I educated myself with being around really smart geologists, but had all these Friedland stories from my dad, who was one of Friedland's first friends when Friedland moved to Vancouver, about all Friedland's successes and trials of different deals. And, you know, when I started to hear about how Friedland would parade around a boardroom or, you know, during the Boise's Bay, took his shoe off and was banging the table, I started to learn what this industry was kind of missing. And this is kind of what I brought in and the team that I work with is, 
you know, there's there's an, a nice box that a lot of us sit in and we know how to cross the T's, dot the I's. And he, I'm uh, usually on the outside scribbling on the lines of the box, trying to trying to try something new, more innovative. And, you know, when you look at an exploration project, when you're looking for a major mine, you know, it's real simple to be conservative publicly and exciting internally. Um, I'm reverse. I'm uh, conservative internally and I'm 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 more honest with my audience of how excited I am publicly. And, um, you know, best kept secrets don't don't get too much investor attention and not too many people make money off them. So for me, it's been outside the box, share the real enthusiasm that exists behind the scenes with the general market and ensure all the things we try to achieve by hard work and working with really good people. And so, you know, if you work 18 hours a day for four years on a company, I could almost guarantee you, you're going to end up with some, some kind of great success for your shareholders. And that's certainly been the path that we've taken a few times over now. And, and it's led us to some great discoveries in Keegan, the 5 million ounces we found, or in Caden, when we sold it to Agnico Eagle for 205 million after a hundred drill holes in the middle of the bear market. I think that brought us to Oren and Sean and I looked at each other and said, Hey, how can we raise the bar much higher? You know, we have all these avenues. We have great shareholders that follow us. We have great great access to money. And we looked at each other and said, you know, we're, we're going to build a legacy together here. And let's see if we can go in and find a, a 10, 20, 30 million ounce discovery and, and punch one of the big ones on the clock. Right. And, uh, where that came out so far is a portfolio, you know, of seven projects and a few of them certainly have that potential, but more importantly, you know, outside of those projects, we found the, the right geologist to go build out a team so that we could actually go do this in an intelligent, you know, very technically driven manner. And that's the Michael Hendrickson and Dave Smithson and the, a lot of the former Newmont global experts, right? So that's how we came to where we're at right now is uh, it's a very exciting time ahead for us. And so the two major projects you're focusing in on now is Committee Bay, and that's in, in the Arctic, and Sombrero in Peru. And so most most mining company executives would look at one, especially in a junior, one or the other, and say, all right, we're going to devote all our resources there. But for you, not good enough. You got to go for both and just really totally uh, knock the ball out of the park, if you will. Uh, what is it like juggling a couple of massive potential projects like that? Well, with full candidness, and that's what you're going to get from me here is a couple things. One, we spent a hundred, raised a hundred million the last four and a half years for Oren to do all of that, to take on seven projects in the portfolio. And you're right. We narrowed it down to two major flagships, Committee Bay. It's a gold greenstone belt that has gold from one end to the other. It's 300 kilometers long. There's been 20 million, or sorry, a hundred million spent over 20 years before we got it. And those people barely scratched the surface, although they did find a nice deposit in the middle of the belt that looks like it can get bigger. But if I tell you in your in your wildest dreams, how would you like 300 kilometers or 220 miles of gold, high grade gold? Mm -hmm you know, being found on a belt, like it doesn't get better than that. And, you know, you ask a good question, how do you handle more than just that? Why don't you put all your resources just on Committee Bay? Um, Committee Bay is uh, weather driven because it is in the Arctic. So the exploration we've done has been in the, in the midsummer months. And so we get about two months a year or two and a half months a year to go up there and work. And, you know, physically, we've only been on the ground for about nine months and we've taken 254 drill holes 400,000 mm. soil or till samples along this belt we've mapped the entire belt and we've really attacked this thing in an unhealthy pace and i say this you know a little <laughs> tongue-in-cheek but we pushed yeah. it really hard because we think we're going to find not just one but multiple big discoveries there now having seven projects you have optionality you can if one project's not working out you can go to the next we have to stay interesting to stay in front of the money and we certainly had the real estate to go explore. Um, about a year and a half ago, we got boots on the ground at Sombrero, this project in Peru that was extremely overlooked by some of the biggest mining companies in the world and no disregard to them. But again, this comes down to people looking within a box and saying, hey, those rocks look like they may be younger than they should be for big deposits to be there. Nobody really shook a stick at the project. And we came in and found out that 
the rocks are actually the right age. And not only that, there's a huge amount of copper and gold all over the place on surface. Mm. And now we're drawing a comparison to uh, a mine like Las Bombas that's like $60 billion in gross value. R- ridiculous amount of metal that's nearby. But, you know, we're copper, gold, they're copper, molybdenum. So it's it's our, our more of our forte for metals we'd like to find. But, you know, to summarize those two points there is, um, you know, the more projects you have, the more financeable you are, the less risk you have, and you can mitigate seasonality. And that's most certainly why we were taken on two flagships. And it hasn't been easy by any point, but we've come to a point where we understand the opportunities the most where we sit today and, and what's in front of us based on the work we've done. Okay. So when you were a stockbroker and just starting out to 22 years old, you know, it's, it's like Steve Jobs said, you connect the dots going backwards rather than going forward. Uh, do you have any idea you would be at this point now, really, of of legendary discoveries? You know, uh, the bar, I've always set the bar high, because if you don't set the bar high, you don't achieve great things, right? Um, at first, I thought I was going to be a broker for 20 years. I didn't think I would make the switch, right? I read a book called Buffettology. It was about Warren Buffett and how he became a contrarian at a young age, and, and that was the focus of his investing. If you remember back in 99, 2000, that was the peak of the dot-com. That's when I stepped foot in the industry. And I was buying mining stocks because I couldn't understand the two, three hundred dollar IPOs. I didn't really like I'm a a very vision driven person. I didn't really get the vision of what I was going to be today until I went negative a million dollars. And at that point is where I saw the clear path that no matter what it took, I didn't care how hard I had to work, how many flights I had to do a year. I was going to get to a certain level where I'm at today. and, And so far I'm there and I'm establishing new goals for myself for the next 20 years of being around this business. It's like Lee Iacocca said, you had the luxury of adversity, which is really what uh, builds character and pushes you to do great things that you never believed you could possibly do. And one of the things that impressed me, your presentation that I got to uh, sit in on in Vancouver is this artificial intelligence. Now, it's one thing for AI to figure out whether you're uh, worthy of a mortgage or, uh, you know, uh, to How to go, market yeah. consumer goods to you or what have you, yes. Yeah, but to actually use it for exploration and uh, to actually focus your drilling efforts, uh, this is pretty revolutionary, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And I'll be honest, when I first heard about it being used in the industry, I was a skeptic. And I was like, well, where I've made a lot of really good decisions, and my partner Sean as well and our team, has been off instinct, you know, I've spent my career reading the gut of my geologist and I'm like, there's no way a computer will be able to give me a gut feeling. But I've learned recently in the last year, as we've been developing our AI platform we're working with, it's a lot better than gut feel because there's no bias. It's numbers. And when you can take bias out of science, bias out of the treasure hunt, that's when you get real results that you can be quantified and not just qualitatively, but also quantify it with, you know, what you're looking for. And so the, the most, the biggest way to distinguish a mining company's use of AI platform is not so much the engine, the computer processing. I think we all have access to the same neural networks that Google and Netflix are using and whatnot. Um, it's going to be the inputs that, that go in. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's 20 years of work on Committee Bay before us, and in four years, we've collected so much data on the entire belt. We've spent $54 million collecting data with these former Newmont global experts, and they do it at the, the standard that Newmont would do it at, which is an incredible high standard for the data. So when you have high-quality data that you've obviously paid more than the average person for, and you put that into a computer, and you have a lot of it over a large area, that's where the AI part starts to get extremely exciting. And you know, I've had a preamble of what's to come in terms of the targeting and you know, I think it's next week we'll have our announcement out sometime. This would be about second, third week of February. And um, we are just blown away by what it came up with. And it's not so much that it may be able to find us big deposits. It's how close we were on some of the holes we were drilling. Wow. But n- n- none of our holes were in the AI target. They were on the edge of them in a few places, which people will see, which is just absolutely fascinating. And, you know, so far, 
if you're trying to challenge something and disprove it or find, you know, a skeptical reason to say it may not work, we haven't seen that yet. We've only seen it complement what we were doing and say that we were close. Um, an example in one area, too, is there's some shallow lakes up in the Arctic and there's no way we would ever take soil or till samples or map the rocks underneath the lake. There's just no way nobody would yeah. do that. But the AI can process all the regional data. It can take all the work around that lake. It can take the structural interpretations that you can fly over and do. And it gave us a couple big targets under the lakes, you know, and these aren't deep lakes. You can drill right through them. They wouldn't be an issue if you're mining, you could drain them. They're maybe five or six feet deep. They're not deep at all. And my point is, we would never have gone there in 20 years had we not seen the AI pointing us to go drill under those lakes. And if you understand geology well, a lot of times there's a, you know compression in the earth and there's wherever there's a, a sunken area, generally there's a lake or crevice occurs. And that usually has a structural you know complement to it, which could be where a gold deposit occurs. So, you know, this is just something next level. And, you know, I think if I compliment our former Newmont global experts, these guys are extremely innovative. You know, we use drones right away up at Committee Bay so we could be on the belt year round, you know, mapping structures and counting rusty boulders. Um, we've tried uh, all kinds of different innovative ways to target. Uh, one of the ways they've used this long wave infrared from satellites, you know, mm -hmm. to measure the temperature of clays and, and rocks that are coming out of epithermal systems, like any new technology that exists, our geologists tend to go focus on it. And so Sean and I have been huge supporters of, of innovation and especially with a belt like Committee Bay, not because it's 95% covered by till, which is its own challenge, but it might have five or six, you know, massive deposits on it. And that's the real appeal to go and push things like this for. So geologists, uh, especially world-class geologists like you have on the team, obviously they've got egos and they look at AI. I don't think they feel particularly threatened by it, but do they ever disagree with the findings of the AI and say, that just can't be, that's impossible. And in that case, uh, who wins here? Who figures out, well, do we go with the AI or do we go with the gut? Well, great question there. And, um, you know, having had seen the preamble and watching all the psychology of the geologists and the AI platform come into into our office, there, there was certainly some friction between the geologists and the AI initially. And, um, you know, what the end result was, everyone's a skeptic of something new, but our geologists are open minded and I compliment them for being that way. And what came out of it was you know, we were on, we're on the edge of at least two discoveries and we think we would have got there naturally. It's, it's coinciding with the AI. So we're really excited about that. But what they're saying is kind of what I said before, like we had no idea we're on a big 20 kilometer long shear zone. We had no idea that there was such a, a strong target underneath this little body of water. And they're like, there's no way we would have ever found that. So I think it's being an incredible compliment. I love the fact, or they love the fact that it's unbiased and that it's processing their high quality inputs that they've put in. So the AI is working off of all their inputs. So they, they can only pat themselves in the back if it works because <laughs> the inputs are going to kick out the end result. But uh, most certainly, and you'll see it soon, two of these targets we were on the edge of based on the work they've done. And so very, very exciting. And, you know, one in particular, we, we drilled a hole last year, 20 meters of half a gram. And that was a very consistent hole and it's low grade you need to be five or six grams or better we understand that but 20 consistent meters of half a gram no spikes of grade nothing tells you you're in a fluid system right if right. you look at three bluffs there's a lot of that drilled peripheral to the eight gram deposit so you know you're close we had to make a decision last summer on the fly and do we go to the south or do we go to the north a few hundred meters and we chose to go to the south it was a guess right there's no way of us to know and the ai picked to go to the north and so we just picked the wrong way we didn't know but now we know right so when you get those kind of answers out of the AI in an area that you're compressed for time, you can't drill, get results and keep moving your drill around. I think it's going to shorten the path to major discoveries. And, you know, this summer, you know, we have a chance to make history with machine learning at Committee Bay and not just drilling a couple good holes, Kerry. I'm talking about if we find a five or 10 million ounce deposit using AI, I think we'll be the first.
course to have done that. And that'll go down in the history books as an exploration group. And uh, so that's the opportunity for us in terms of legacy outside of the money we'd make our shareholders. It's, it's pretty fascinating. It's, it's incredible. And the technology never ceases to amaze. It's kind of like using AI for mining is kind of what's happened in oil with fracking where the you know they never hit a dry hole it's seldom ever hit a dry hole they might hit a hole with not as much production as they'd like but maybe we're kind of heading that way in mining too where the ai is such a good tool and so essential to focusing your your efforts and drilling that really we get to that point where you know we we see a lot more uh, production because you're drilling in the right place. Well, just on that note, the future of big deposits being found in our industry on the planet, and I, I like to think, we all like to think the easy ones have been found because the last five years, we have another company that had 17 million in the treasury looking for committee bays and sombreros, couldn't find it. But the future is going to be hidden discoveries. And that's mm. where the big ones are going to come from. And, uh, you know, to get through that cover, the five to 20 meters of cover on the rocks, you're going to need something more than the best geologist in the world to do that. And either you're going to have to have a big budget for wildcat cat drilling, just closing your eyes and guessing, or you're going to have to use things like AI and different levels of science to get there. And the last point I'll make is, you know, you look at Committee Bay and you say, okay, Ivan, you're using AI, you've done all your data, you've got really good inputs, but what's your real estate like? And we look at the mines nearby, whether it's Amaruk, the last mine found in the world over 5 million ounces, there are 6 million ounces, about 6 grams per ton. Or you look at Meliodine, 11 million ounces, 7 grams per ton. The real estate that Committee Bay offers us as investors, as, an, as a mining company, exploration company, is for, in my opinion, some of the biggest high-grade deposits in the world in an area that is only concerned or the main concern is weather. You know, th th that's something that I, I like to go to sleep on and say, hey, the guys next door can mine year-round and they can drill year-round if, you know, it's expensive, but if you find it, it's worth it. But if all we have to worry about up north is the weather and at Committee Bay, there's there's a, there's barely any people up there. Um, they're very inviting, the Inuit. Um, there's no geopolitical risk. The government won't nationalize. It's northern Canada. It's an area that gets more support than anything else for mines to be found. And if you find them, they're going to be really big. And so, you know, the real estate that we can use the AI on is great. And then just for clarification for a project like Sombrero, you can't bring AI to Sombrero until you've drilled at least 100 or 200 holes because you have to ground truth your surface work by drilling it to know what inputs to put into the machine learning, right? right? So, you know, that's the that's the opportunity at Committee Bay. The AI is outstanding. And then Sombrero is, is a different beast that I don't think it's going to ever need AI because it is a lot more outcropping and obvious than um, what we're dealing with at Committee Bay. Yeah, amazing. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the financial aspect of this because the exploration is real exciting. The financing can really be a pain. I mean, it's, it's work, it's uh, being out there, getting the company known, but fortunately in Oren's case, uh, hasn't been that much of a challenge to get the financing, the needed financing. Yeah. So just a comment on the financing there. I'm, we obviously, if you look at our financials, we're sub $2 million. We, we don't need money today, but we would need money in May. Um, we have seven projects and the projects that don't meet the five, 10 million ounce kind of threshold for us are projects we would be transactional on if we got the right price. Uh, there's two in particular that we are in very mature discussions with uh, towards asset sales. I'm marketing in the coming weeks and I'm not looking for money. I'm looking to create awareness on what Sombrero represents and talk about the AI at Committee Bay. But, um, you know, at the same time, uh, what we're looking at is a potential asset sale uh, to accommodate us for one year of drilling both on Committee Bay and on Sombrero, as well as GNA. That would be from one asset sale. And if a second asset sale happens, you know, we could look at an additional three or four years of aggressive working wow. capital to keep drilling. And so the, the one thing that we've talked about when we put this company together in the portfolio sense was high quality projects at various 
various stages will offer different opportunities. Obviously, discovery being the number one check check mark to have, but fi- self financing abilities. I mean, if we can sell two projects this year and not have to say the word financing for the next four years and go deliver a major discovery either in Peru or up in Community Bay, you know, that's a spectacular opportunity as an exploration company to present to shareholders. Right now, what if you don't sell them, Ivan, and and you you need money in May? What what should we expect? Well, a couple things. One is because we've raised a lot of money, we've made a lot of shareholders a lot of money. We have a lot of support from a key group of shareholders. If we had to buy ourselves a little bit of time, we do a small round, $5 million between a few of us, um, some friends, family, and key investors. And uh, we would buy some more time until we need the big capital for drilling, which would be more of uh, July, August this summer. And alternatively, we've signed several CAs on Sombrero. And um, you know, if another corporate investment occurred, you know, that would be another thing that could fund us on top of asset sales. So we kind of have the best of both worlds. We can either sell assets to finance ourselves for four years of working capital, or we can do a small, you know, pass the hat around a few of us internally and do a small raise until we bring on a corporate investor. Once we're at the peak speculation about to go drilling, um, Gold Corp, Newmont is our largest shareholder. They own 12 and a half percent. They've been extremely supportive and very helpful. We certainly appreciate them. But, um, you know, Sombrero does draw a very big base metal crowd as well. Um, right now, I'm going to say the optionality for financing is something enjoyable to, to consider, not something we are worried about. So, you know, for us, it's, it's something that what can we do as the largest shareholders of our company collectively as management to protect the dilution for shareholders and treat our company how a shareholder would want that to be treated? Uh, first objective would be to sell assets that you're not going to keep and sell finance. Second objective would be to achieve a premium as we put out a lot of more trench results out of Peru uh, towards drilling Committee Bay and Peru this summer, and then hopefully attract a, a corporate investor at that time, you know, to to balance out the portfolio, the, the shareholder base, and uh, and go that way while asset sales can happen in the background. Yeah, and your capital structure is pretty good, so it isn't all diluted out like you see so many uh, companies in the sector. So yeah. that's a good thing. 90 million shares out. We own 15%. Gold Corp Newmont, uh, they own 12.5%. And, um, you know, we could collectively probably put another 40% into one room with key supportive shareholders. That's about 70% that are in a very good place. The balance of 30%. You know, I think it, it follows us with good and bad days in the gold market, but people that are quite familiar with our successes. So, you know, we, we pride ourselves on who we have aligned ourselves with as shareholders. We certainly appreciate our existing shareholders, but the, 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 this, the company trades extremely well when it when it needs to. You know, if there's good news or, you know, obviously if the market is soft or bad, then it's going to pull back as well. But when there's really good news, there's a really good chance for us to create robust returns because of how well held our shares are. And I guess we'll leave it at that. So I'm sure you're going to want to check this company out. You probably know about them already. The website is orinresources.com, A-U-R-Y-N resources.com. The symbol both on the TSX and the uh, NYSE American is AUG, which I love when I see the same symbol on multiple exchanges. It means somebody figured something out here that it's a good idea to have the same symbol (laughs) on multiple exchanges. (laughs) Well put. (laughs) It drives you crazy. And I should also mention, uh, hey, I'm looking at your site and I was about to look at Kitco, but it's there. Uh, Gold is uh, up uh, to almost two and a half bucks to 13, 13, 13, which if you're into numerology probably means something. But uh, anyway, any interesting number for sure and it also happens to be the 13th of february so go figure right oh geez that, that i didn't realize it. <laughs> i, I want to think those are lucky numbers for yeah. all of us and uh timing is good it's been a really good day so far for us yes. and uh, internally and um and market wise so uh, we'll take that as a positive note yeah absolutely hey and thank you for sponsoring the show uh, financial survival network is our eighth year and companies like you help us get the message out we wish you the best of luck ivan it sounds like i don't know how you sleep at night because uh, there's so much much exciting news on the horizon and you're just waiting for that one key piece which probably is going to come very shortly 
I appreciate it. And thanks so much for having us on your show. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's tough to sleep, but, um, you know, for good reasons. And, and that's the kind of position you want to be in as an executive of any exploration company. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 